looking at the history of the nation that we live in, America's most recent history has been described by three expressions. Those three expressions are, number one, we had the age of industry. Most of us can remember a period in American history when technology in various industrial fields and various industrial opportunities was growing. And as a result, the nation began a financial boom. We began a industrial uh, step of progress. And then we just came through a period in American history that is commonly referred to as the age of technology. It may surprise you to know that today, because of computers, we thought it would save us time, but the cry of the public is, computers don't save us time, they actually demand more time. More production if you work on a computer. We are expected to produce more. All of this has resulted in what we call the age of anxiety. And America today is living in the most stressful period in all of her history. There are many factors that contribute to that. Let me just mention some very practical ones for just a moment. If you look at American history, there was a period of time when America did not spend 20, 24 hours a day out running around. There was a period of time when there were no electric lights. That's only a 100 year old invention step of progress. But without lights, you don't have the malls to go to. People, instead of running around, came home and people lived in the dark, so to speak. But as a result, it created a certain pace of life for every one of us. Not only that, according to the New York Times, one Sunday edition of the New York Times contains more information or has contained more information than Americans do in a lifetime 200 years ago. We are overwhelmed with all kinds of information. Technology has been so wonderful, it has created for us the ability, according to one study, for us in our lifetime to actually need to cross the path of 20 thousand pieces of equipment. Horse and buggy driving in the early history of America was the fastest speed you could travel. Today, 70 miles an hour is almost a uh, get out of the way. I'm riding on the interstate with my children and I'm driving 75 and my children are yelling at me, Dad, slower traffic needs to be in the right lane. And they mean it. Now, that's not to say I always drove 75, because that's not true. But it is to say that we are at a breakneck speed as a culture. Not only that, it may surprise you to know that technological progress has brought us to the place that our income as a nation is staggering. According to the federal government, Americans financially reached the peak of their income in 1973. Someone says, how did we keep going for the last almost 50 years? What kept the progress going? Two things. American wives going to work outside the home. Number two, as Americans, credit became the means of us advancing ourselves. And so we have information overload, we have financial overload, we have a time overload. Let me just mention this, we have a choice overload. Many of us grew up in a world where you either drank coffee or you didn't drink coffee. Today you can drink coffee and it will be caffeinated or decaffeinated or half caffeinated. You can have an espresso 
It can come as a latte. It can come as a cappuccino, and I could go down a long list, and it just goes on and on and on. Americans today are experiencing another overload. In 1978, there were 11,767 items in the average supermarket. Today, there are 24,000. 531. You and I are experiencing something that the book of Ecclesiastes deals with and what Solomon summarizes in one word, it is an exercise in futility, is what we are in as a culture. Take your Bibles and turn with me, if you will, please, to the book of Ecclesiastes. Chapter 4. Ecclesiastes, chapter 4. In the midst of all of the information overload, the time demand overload, the lack of the ability to be together as a family, which has been a rich part of our early history, in spite of the fact that our days have, instead of being a nine to five day and time with our family afterwards, we have 24 hour stores, we have 24 hour gas stations, we conduct business at night just like it's bright sunshine. All of that comes out of one driving motivation. We in our culture call it materialism. Solomon, without using the word, refers to that driving motivation. Look, if you will, Ecclesiastes chapter 4 and verse number 4. And if you do not have a Bible, it is on the screen behind me. Solomon says, again, I saw that for all toil and every skillful work, a man is envied by his neighbor this also is vanity or futility and grasping for the wind. The fool folds his hands and consumes his own flesh. Better is a handful with quietness than both handfuls together with toil and grasping for the wind. Then I returned and I saw vanity under the sun. There is one alone without companion. He has neither son nor daughter, yet there is no end to all his labors, nor is his eye satisfied with riches. But he never asks, for whom do I toil and deprive myself of good? This also is vanity and a grave misfortune. Solomon didn't live in America. And he didn't live in the 21st century. But in his own day and in his own way, Solomon understood a perspective on what life that cultures adopt. And that is that materially advancing ourselves is what life is all about. In the passage that is before us, Solomon describes three different kinds of approach to the problem. Notice, if you would, please, in verse 4, if we can back the screen up for those who do not have a Bible. Verse number 4. Again, I saw that for all toil and every skillful work, a man is envied of his neighbor. It's interesting. Only the neighbor envies us. The translators dealing with this verse have translated it two different ways. The King James and American Standard Version translate it for which a man is envied. But most other translations translate it this way. Uh, let me back up to, I've left the, the main part of the verse just for the expression. Verse 4, for all the toil and skillful work, a man finds himself in mutual envy of his neighbor. Several translations translate with a rivalry between 
a man and his neighbor. In other words, Solomon looks at life and Solomon is saying that the drive to achieve financially is really the drive to be top dog. It's the drive to be better than. It's the drive to be ahead of. Rivalry, which is used here in many of the translations, rivalry actually is the struggle to outdo, outwit, outperform, outproduce, to advance ourselves above those who are around us. Listen to these words written by Michael Horton, a Christian author, who states, and I quote, We live in a day when your marriage has to be the best made in heaven, even though you're living on earth. Your kids have to make the dean's list and study in the best schools. Your past work experience needs to be brilliant, groundbreaking in order to get ahead. And if you stop long enough to take a vacation, it needs to be an unforgettable package at an amazing resort with nonstop fun. How many of you have played the game Monopoly? How many of you liked the game Monopoly? Well, you tell me a lot by that hand raising. My wife and I played Monopoly one time. <laughs> when we were dating in college, I took her to a parlor we had on campus, and we sat down to play the game of Monopoly. And when the game was over, my wife's statement to me was this, I will never again play Monopoly with you. <laughs> and in 50 years almost, she's kept her word. Now, why don't we like Monopoly? Let's stop and think. What is Monopoly really about? Is it about winning the game? Or is it the determination, like when the ball is spiked on the basketball court, to drive our opponent into the ground? I mean, you can't just have red, I'm sorry, yes, red, yellow, green, and blue places on the board. You have to have hotels so that if anybody lands on all of any of your property, all of their resources are immediately gone. In other words, monopoly is really about empire building. And why is it we want to have our own financial empire? We want to be the envy of our neighbor. We want to be better than our neighbor. And in that struggle, we have created an entire national economy that drives every one of us into the ground. Listen to these words from Harvard Business School doing a study on the subject of competition and what it has done to America. The Harvard Business School published these words. America today is struggling with a comparison obsession. A former student who graduated 10 years ago with a terrific job at a Fortune 500 company suffers from comparison obsession. At least it seemed like a terrific job until she received the alumni newsletter and learned that a fellow alumnus in the Master of Business Associates uh, program who graduated with her had been named vice president of a company. From that moment on, she could barely hold a conversation without bemoaning her lack of promotion. Business executives, Wall Street analysts, lawyers, and doctors are continually obsessed with comparing their achievement versus the achievement of others in their own profession and find themselves trapped by this comparison. I would remind you this morning of 2 Corinthians chapter 10 and verse number 12, and I want you to notice on the screen behind me, 
Paul says, for we dare not class ourselves or compare ourselves with those who commend themselves. Now, in context, he is dealing with the Judaizers who are comparing themselves to him and contrasting themselves to him. But he deals with the principle. And the principle is the danger of starting to compare. He goes on to say this, verse 12, but they measuring themselves by themselves and comparing themselves among themselves are not wise. In comparing, you only can have two basic options if it's not Jesus Christ. I am better, which is nothing more than pride and an ego booster. I am not as good as, which will destroy creativity and discipline. The process is not a constructive process. We are to be conformed to the image of Jesus Christ and we only have one question. Where do we stand in relationship to his image and what he wants for us? And our culture is built on this driving force of I must outdo him, we must outdo them, our team better than them. I went to a grandson's football game recently. And at the football game, they won, and they've won all year long. When they were finished, I was surprised to notice how much ego you could see by their response to victory. There's nothing wrong with winning and nothing bad in losing if you have done your best. We begin every athletic event with these words. It's important that we have some actual courtesy on the field. That is the last time you'll hear that term in sports and often in business. They're just words that have no meaning anymore. What happens is we are driven and we drive and it is because we constantly have to be ahead. Take your Bible and turn with me to the book of 1 Timothy chapter 6 this morning. 1 Timothy chapter 6. Timothy is the pastor of the church at Ephesus. And when Paul writes 1 Timothy, it is actually a continuance of the book of Ephesians, but it is the practical side of life in the congregation. And when we come to 1 Timothy chapter 6, and we'll look at two different sections of this chapter this morning, but when we come to 1 Timothy chapter number 6, Timothy tells us, as we read this passage, that this drive for more is a consuming passion. Notice 1 Timothy 6 and verse number 17. Paul says to Timothy, beginning at verse number 17, Command those who are rich in this present age. And now he gives the instruction. Instruction number one. Don't let it go to your head. Don't let your financial situation make you to have a big ego or be an ego builder. Notice verse 17. Command those who are rich in this present age not to be haughty. Secondly, notice the concern is where do you put your confidence? Nor to trust in uncertain riches, but in the living God who gives us richly all things to enjoy. Thirdly, notice, let them do good. In other words, serve, and he lists ways of serving. Let them do good that they may be rich in good works, ready to give, willing to share, storing up for themselves a good foundation for the time to come, that they may lay hold of eternal life. What's the expression lay hold of eternal life mean in that context? Lay hold of is actually it is the anchor of what my life is all about. My life is not about where I am financially. 
My life is not about where I am business-wise. My life is really not registered in my own mind as being I'm academically, financially, business-wise ahead of anyone. Those things are not the place that I place my advantage. I place my advantage on being in Christ. I'm laying hold of eternal life. Go back to the book of Ecclesiastes, and Solomon is going to state the same in principle. Ecclesiastes chapter 4, and notice, if you would please, once again, beginning at verse number 4. Ecclesiastes chapter 4 and verse number 4. Again, and this is this continual search through the book of life without meaning lived only under the sun on a horizontal focus, not on a vertical or eternal focus. Again, I saw that for all toil and every skillful work, a man is in mutual rivalry with his neighbor. This also is vanity and grasping for the wind. The fool folds his hands and consumes his own flesh. Better a handful with quietness than both hands full, together with toil and grasping for the wind. If you want to take and outline this passage, because we're going to be in it for probably three messages. Let me just mention, first of all, we see in verse number four an illustration of the man who is a workaholic. I am identified by my job. I am identified by my career. I am identified by where I fit in the socioeconomic ladder because of what I have achieved. And in verse number four, you have a man who is willing to trade everything for success. Solomon begins to show us that that ends up becoming an albatross around his neck. It eventually affects him such that he does not have any relationships whatsoever. He, by the choice to actually put career and job and financial advancement first, is going to cut off all relationships, often with his own wife and even his own children. I find it interesting if you'll drop down to Ecclesiastes 4 and notice, if you would, beginning at verse number 7. He describes this problem very clearly. He said, Then I returned, and I saw vanity under the sun. There is one alone without companion. He has neither son nor brother, yet There is no end to all his labors, nor is his eye satisfied with riches. But he never asks, for whom do I toil and deprive myself of good? This also is vanity and a grave misfortune. The man who actually becomes a miser in order to get ahead, and that's the story of Ebenezer Scrooge. No relationship is important, and he's willing to trade everything to succeed financially. But that's not the only person in this passage. Notice, if you will, the opposite is mentioned. Ecclesiastes chapter 4, look at verse 5. Verse number 5 says this. The fool folds his hands and consumes his own flesh. I don't want to get into the rat race. I don't want to do all that fighting. I'm not willing to go through all that hassle. You know what I'm going to do? I'll just take a step back and I'll disengage. And the person becomes lazy and the person has no value system and no priorities and discipline simply is out the window over a period of time. As a believer, the answer is not to be a workaholic, nor is it to be lazy. But having money as the driving force, success as the driving force, accomplishment as the driving force, 
Those things will cause us to take principle, send it out the window, and ultimately destroy ourselves. Many people climb the ladder of success only to find it is leaning against the wrong wall. Many of you know the name of Charles Schwab. Charles Schwab was the first president of U.S. Steel. Charles Schwab spent the last five years of his life in poverty and dependent because his empire was destroyed by events he had no idea was coming and because of the fact that he had actually traded money for relationship. And as a result, in his isolation, he found himself alone in poverty. Albert Fall was the Secretary of the Interior under President Harding. He accepted a bribe to allow government land to have oil uh, production on the government land without the government's awareness, and he was receiving kickbacks. As a result of that, in 1931, he went to prison, and he spent the end of his life in prison in order to succeed. Even in the church of Jesus Christ, this problem exists. I don't know about you, but I have been to many pastors' conventions, and I really do not enjoy the conversation other than the speakers. Because eventually this question will come up. Well, how many are attending? What does that question mean? It's code language with, are you succeeding or are you failing? What I'm tempted to do is to give them the numbers from Christmas and Easter and let them feel badly. I read the story of a pastor who was seated on a Sunday afternoon in his home with his son. A little six-year-old boy spoke to his father and said to his father, he said, Dad, when you're seated up on the platform, before you go up to preach, you always bow your head and close your eyes. And what are you doing at that time? The son replied, I'm sorry, the father replied, son, I'm praying. I'm asking God to give me a good sermon. The little boy replied, well, why doesn't he? <laughs> Dad responded, go to your room. Christians are not to be competitors. The Bible is very clear that as Christians, we're co-laborers. That's what our whole relationship is about. Unlike Israel, in Israel, do you understand that every Jew was isolated when it came to family worship and when it came to the temple? But in the church, we have been all baptized into one body under one head. And the design of God was that believers see themselves as part of something far bigger than I am, than we are, and desire to cooperate and to work together to accomplish God's will. Marty Seligman, professor of psychology at the University of Pennsylvania, doing a study on the subject of depression wrote the following. He said, we have discovered that if you are born after 1945, you are 10 times more likely to suffer depression than those who were born before 1945. That seems strange to us since after 1945, we've had so many more possessions. We've been able to live life so much more comfortably. Why would depression be on the increase? Primitive cultures, we have discovered, don't show cases of depression normally. We decided to do a study of the Amish in Lancaster, Pennsylvania, and were dismayed to learn the rate of depression among the Amish is one-fifth the rate of depression of the citizens of Baltimore, Maryland. 
we cannot help but ask the question, what is creating all of the depression in modern cities? We have more because we want more. We want more and don't have more, and so we are more unhappy. And that begins to cause us to probe. What drives the culture? Take your Bible and turn with me, if you will, please, back to 1 Timothy chapter 6. 1 Timothy chapter 6. What drives the American culture is that which we hate the most, but it does drive us. We are seated in our home. We are watching a television program. It used to be at 15 minutes after the hour, for a minute to a minute and a half, we would have an interruption. That interruption was an advertisement. That has become two minutes in a 12-minute segment on a program. Advertising is the secret of the American economy, and it is driving us into the ground and up a wall. According to one study, the average American is exposed to 5,000 advertisements a day. That's not my statement. Log on to the internet and the ads begin to flow. Go to Facebook and anything that we've looked at, we all of a sudden, from shopping or surfing, find ourselves with a blitz of ads. Tune in to a podcast. Slowly but imperceptibly, we are being driven by constantly being bombarded. Dennis Johnson writes the following. He said, I am cynical because I realize the economic health of our nation depends on cultivating discontent in the American public. In an article entitled Robbed of Rest from Moody uh, Monthly Magazine, I quote, is the drive for more driving you crazy? Keeping the American family dissatisfied is vital to our economic system. In order to lure me to a particular product, an advertiser will create dissatisfaction with what I have and a nagging desire for things I may not really need. To my dismay, I've come to realize that keeping me coming back to make more purchases is the key to the entire future of our enterprise system. I've come to realize that to stimulate the economy, I must buy. And to make me keep buying, advertising drives me. This, this is the downside. To keep the economy moving by keeping me coveting, to keep me coveting, sales must keep me dissatisfied. We are continuously assaulted by advertising. Drive down the highway. It used to be that at least the sign would stay the same for three months, six months, nine months, a year. Now we've gone electronic. And so it's continually more and more and more and more. My wife and I picked up the mail yesterday at the mailbox, and I couldn't believe the stack of mail this high. In all of those mail items, there was only three pieces of real mail. You say, what was the rest of it? Advertisements, advertisements, upcoming sales, getting me excited about spending money. That's the American economic system. Take your Bible and look with me at 1 Timothy chapter 6. And notice, if you will, please, beginning at verse number six. 
in a context where Paul is dealing with false teaching, and that's really what chapter 6 is about as a whole. But in the middle of it, Paul says this to Timothy and to the church at Ephesus. Now godliness with contentment is great gain. How do you find contentment? Contentment has properly been defined this way. When my earning power is more than my yearning power. The drive for more is less than. He gives us in this passage three very simple keys to learning contentment. Number one, look at verse number seven. We brought nothing into this world. So the truth of the matter is, I really don't own anything. Everything that I own has been a gift of God, regardless of what it is and regardless of how much I contributed to having it. The truth is, God gave it. And if I realize I started with nothing, and then I realize the second principle that he brings out, notice, if you will, verse 7. And it is certain we can carry nothing out. If I begin with nothing, and someone has well said, shrouds have no pockets, and I carry nothing out, then the truth of the matter is, when you get right down to it, I really don't have anything. Everything that I enjoy is the goodness of God in my life, and it is temporary. Amen. Then he gives us the basic drive of what contentment is all about. Verse 8. And having food and clothing, with these we shall be content. Recognizing basic needs are sufficient. Is that all that's required? It's all that's needed from our standpoint in our spirit. We have more than that. I have more than that. I walk in, I look at my closet. And I say to myself, God, I cannot believe how much you have given to me. I walk into our home and I look at the beauty of our home. I look at the yard that we have and I say to myself, God, we don't deserve this. And the truth of the matter is Solomon tells us exactly what Paul tells us. And that is that the drive for more is an exercise in vanity. He goes on to say this. Notice in verse number 9. The King James translates it, uh, but those who will to be rich. The word will is actually the Greek word thelema, and it's translated in the New King James in its proper way, its clearest way, which is desire. Those who desire to be rich, our desires produce, notice verse 9, temptation and a trap. But those who desire to be rich fall into temptation and a snare and into many foolish and harmful lusts which drown men in destruction. For the love of money, not money, but the love of money is a root of all kinds of evil from which some have strayed from the faith in their greediness and pierce themselves through with many sorrows. Pick the Bible up, and the Bible has many examples of people who turn from the faith for money. Let me just name a few. Does the name Ananias and Sapphira ring a bell? Does the name of Gehazi ring a bell? Remember, Elisha was offered to be paid if he would perform the request Elisha turned it down, but Gehazi went after it. Uh, Judas, for 30 pieces of silver, betrayed Jesus Christ. That's the point that Paul is making. If you go back to the book of Ecclesiastes, chapter 4, Solomon reminds us very simply that there are three driving motivations that we must be careful about. Notice, if you will, Ecclesiastes chapter 4, 
Listen to verse number four again. Motivation number one. Again, I saw that for all toil and all, every skillful work, a man is in mutual envy with his neighbor. Jealousy. Motivation number two. Notice, if you will, please, verses six and seven. Better is one handful with quietness than both hands full together with toil and grasping for the wind. Then I returned and saw vanity under the sun, greed. And then notice, if you will, prestige. Drop down, if you will, to verse number 13. And notice what he says. Better a poor and wise youth than an old and foolish king who will be admonished no more. We climb the ladder of success and reach the top rung. We get to the top of the totem pole and we're above any reproof, any correction. Not all societies are like ours. Ours is a very unusual society in world history. This problem has been exaggerated more in America than any nation in the world. Many years ago, I picked up something that I said, boy, does this describe the world we live in. Listen to this analysis. It's entitled, Mr. and Mrs. Thing. Mr. and Mrs. Thing are a very pleasant and successful couple. At least that's the verdict of most people who tend to measure things with a thingometer. When the thingometer is put to work in the life of Mr. and Mrs. Thing, the result is startling. There he is sitting down on a luxurious and very expensive thing, almost hidden by a large number of other things. Things to sit on, things to sit at, things to cook on, things to eat from, all shining and new, things, things, things. Things to clean with, things to wash with, things to clean and things to wash. Things to amuse and things to give pleasure. Things to watch and things to play. Things for the long hot summer and things for the long cold winter on November the 15th. Things for the big thing in which they live. Things for the garden things for the lounge, things for the kitchen, things for the bedroom, things on four wheels and things on two wheels, things to put on top of the thing with four wheels and things to put behind the thing with four wheels, things to add to the interior of the thing with four wheels, things, things, and more things. And that is America. The most toured home in this nation is the White House. But beyond the White House, do you know what the number two most toured place is? The most toured home in America, number two, is a 23-room home in Memphis, Tennessee. It is the home of the king of rock and roll, Elvis Presley. Graceland takes in $15 million a year from people who want to look at the cars, the clothes, the advertise, I'm sorry, the airplanes, and the records. Very few people made what Elvis made in his lifetime, and certainly no one had the fame or the popularity that he had at that time. But at the back door of the home, if you simply walk 50 yards out, 150 feet, there is a tombstone. On August the 16th, 1977, at 42 years of age, he died. He died of an overdose of pills in a state of depression. And he wrote these words that later were placed in his memory. I would give a million dollars for one day of peace. The American dream 
Solomon looks at the American dream and he says, if I chase the American dream, it will become an exercise in futility. It'll be like the dog chasing his own tail. That's where it ultimately will end up. Because there are two things that are realities. No matter how much I have, more increase will never satisfy. And number two, no matter how much I do, more will not bring things to an end. Life is bigger than we are in this day and age. And as believers, our first concern should be, I am created for eternity, not for time. As a believer, I am passing through. This world is not my home. I'm just a passing through. And Solomon says, if I don't understand that, I'm going to build a kingdom here, my own little fiefdom. And I have forgotten there are no fiefdoms for believers here. We are looking for a city whose builder and maker is God. We are looking for a country that is a heavenly country. And our Lord has told us he's gone to prepare a place for you that you and I might be where he is. And as believers, we need to ask ourselves the question, how do I disengage from what I am so entrenched in that is constantly bringing me to the place that I'm choking to death on it? A boy falls in the water and he begins to cry for help. From the side, one dives in to save him, said, I heard you crying for help. I wasn't crying for help, he said. I'm drowning. And we are in a culture that is choking us to death. And we need to just simply recognize it and then deal with it as the Spirit of God gives us peace and direction. Shall we bow our heads in prayer? Father, as we come to you today, we do live in a world where so many things that once gave the American people peace and joy have been laid aside to enter into a race in time that does not yield success, nor does it yield satisfaction. We are like the hamster on a wheel, constantly trying to get ahead. And we find ourselves achieving a new opportunity, a new level, a new door. And as a result, we find ourselves often as believers frustrated because what we had hoped for is not what we find. find. I pray, Father, that you would help us to realize that America, even though you have blessed this country in a wonderful way, we are not without flaws. And as a result, some basic Christian truths and principles get lost in the big picture. It is true that advertising is intended to create dissatisfaction in order for us to buy maybe more than we need, maybe just to feed our ego, whatever the reason being, it certainly does not yield what you have planned for us to learn in whatever state to be content. May the truth of your word find lodging in our hearts to choose obedience, trust, faith, in Jesus' name we pray, amen.